So are you sure you wanna be rich? Consider three things. One, scientists say there's one personality facet. They call them facets of personality. Highly correlated with wealth creation. That's conscientiousness. So number one, are you conscientious? Number two, consider the cost in stress, alienation of family, inevitable um, derogation that comes from those people you pass by, AKA slander. Number three, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. As Elon Musk says, you get paid in proportion to the difficulty of problems you solve. So are you interested in solving a difficult problem? If you pass these three questions with flying colors and you're still intrigued, well, listen up. So the first one, conscientiousness. Sure, sloppy people create wealth once in a while, but not that often. It's a myth. It's a myth by those who teach you that this world's a fair place. This is the laws of the jungle. And the jungle, if you ever watch a nature movie, has very little to do with what's fair, what's reproductive. It's called functionality and evolution. If you study evolutionary psychology, evolutionary biology, you should read Robert Trivers. I'm lucky enough to have him as a mentor, but he started the Harvard Evolutionary Biology Department. And there's rules to this jungle, and the rules aren't necessarily kind. Now, what is conscientiousness? Conscientiousness this breaks down into four sub facets. There's something called the Hexaco quiz, which is more advanced than 16 personalities you see online, which is Myers-Briggs, which is somewhat accurate, but not. And there's the big five, which is the outdated version of the Hexaco. So 25 sub facets of human personality, Hexaco, H-E-X-A-C-O, H for honesty, humility, E for emotionality, X for extroversion. A for agreeableness, C for conscientiousness, O for openness to new experience. So we'll talk about the C for conscientiousness breaks down into four sub facets, perfectionism, diligence, uh, prudence, and organization. So wealth creation, it's been found that those personality traits most related to people who create above average wealth are people high in one or ideally all four. And that's something that some people just don't have, you know? And not everybody, let me put a disclaimer, it's not necessarily that everybody needs to be wealthy. There's not some special virtue in somebody who creates more wealth. In fact, it may be inversely correlated. <laughs> people who create wealth are more like warriors, you know? They're the Genghis Khans of the modern world. I wouldn't look up to them, and I don't look up to them as some sort of saint. Although, through the somewhat now criticized invisible hand theory of capitalism, which for sure has some truth to it. You know, wealthy people do inevitably create good as they pursue their own selfish interests as a warrior, as a conqueror, AKA Genghis Khan, Attila the Hun, the Vikings, you know, the Apache Indians, the Comanches, the United States that conquered the US and every place the inevitability causality of warriors is new civilizations. So. Going back to these sub facets, ask yourself, are you organized? Diligence is otherwise known as hard work. Persistence, not easily someone who gives up. I read an interesting statistic that something like 90% of people give up after three tries. It's something like 70% of people give up after the first time it doesn't work out. <laughs> you lose the next 10, 15% on the second and 90 plus percent are gone after three. So that's the opposite of diligence. Prudence is the wild card. You know, wealth is created, most wealth of the world is created by older people that are in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. If you look at the Forbes list, mostly people are high 50s, 60s, 70s, Warren Buffett's in his 90s, Bernard Alnault. You look at the top of the Forbes list, it's populated by the Zara founder. You know, these are, the Waltons are still on there. Sam Walton's dead. That's how old this dude is. And it, it, there's still wealth being created generally, uh, generally, generationally for his family, the Walton family. So, you know, prudence, like my mentor Joel Salton says, you can't Google experience. So at some level, you will have to become prudent and you only become prudent, AKA wise, good decision maker, chess master that knows which, you know, there's 1100 openings to chess. My grandfather was a chess, my step-grandfather was a ch chess master. My grandpa was a chess, I don't know, I'm not sure if he was quite a chess master. My step-grandpa was this insane um, chess master and high rated and, you know, there's 1,100 chess openings to memorize. People who are prudent, if you want to make money, you're going to have to memorize 
the chess openings that exist that you can learn from the legacy of past business owners and entrepreneurs. If you want to, you know, investors. And then of course, you've got to play some games yourself. You can't just, you want theory and practicality. That's where people get it wrong on social media. Like, oh, I'll you talk about books. I'm like, oh, books is all theory. Come on, man, don't be stupid. I already know that. It's a mix of theory and action that creates a chess master. And it's the same, make no mistake, people who create wealth are modern day chess masters. They're practically applying the rules and the heuristical patterns, the decision-making patterns. And that's what scientists call decision-making, this heuristic pattern. And most people succumb to the 25 cognitive biases. I think there's about 38 psychologists will tell you there's 25. Things like, you know, authority bias, social proof bias. Well, Kantian fairness is one. Reciprocal altruism or reciprocal uh, reciprocity is considered one. Reciprocal altruism is kind of a more advanced version of that. But um, these are those things that make good people make bad decisions. And so to be somebody who understands how to make the right heuristical choice or the right business choice. So the right choice of what to invest in cryptocurrencies and people are like, what coins should I be in? What tokens? Well, that's what prudence is. The person who can see what others can't see, whether it be early trends or whether it be somebody who just makes the calls and nobody always gets it right. But some, the, the your goal in wealth creation is not to be always right. It's to be less wrong than most people. Ain't nobody coming out of this game with no scars. So you have diligence, hard work, you have prudence I talked about, and then you have organization. That means like, is your day just like chicken with a head cut off? Do you have actual prioritization? Napoleon Bonaparte administered and built the largest modern empire and in the Western world, at least. The French, you know, after the French Revolution, he came and basically took the whole Western world. He lost in the end, but everybody, he had a good run from the late 1700s to 1815. He was organized. He woke up at three in the morning to administer his empire, which at that point extended into modern day Italy and all the way Poland, Russia, Germany, Sweden. Of course, he was always fighting the English and he did kind of losing Russia, although it wasn't really a loss. He won, but then he ran out of food in Moscow. He lost at Waterloo and he was exiled on an island off Africa where he died of probably stomach cancer. But the lesson to be learned is he was a master of prioritization and organization. He woke up at three in the morning, he put a stack of paper here that was, okay, here's what I do immediately. And here's what I postpone. And here's what I never do. That's the key to organization. People think, oh, it's always about prioritization. Some stuff's about putting it in the trash. You ain't never getting to it. So organization. And then lastly, perfectionism. It's a lot of sloppy people. I hired 150 people in August or July this year for some of my companies. And it's like, man, the school system has robbed you. It robbed me. I know the feeling. I'm just going, it ain't preparing anybody for anything that's even a semblance of wealth creation, you know? The laws of the jungle are unforgiving business and money. If you want to make money, as I said, number two or whatever number I'm on, consider the cost because the jungle is not something to enter into lightly. And that most people shouldn't. It's okay. You don't have to. You, at the end of the day, everybody dies. Napoleon had the biggest empire ever. He died on a little rock, you know, exiled from mankind. Everybody goes to the grave the same way, <laughs> you know? So. <laughs> Without a heartbeat, that's how it all happens. But for those of you, there are some people just built to want to play those games. And if that's you, you know, you don't have to excuse yourself. It's part of this web of life. And scientists call this frequently frequency dependent selection in terms of personality. And we're built to be different. Some people just like to try to make money. I've always been, even from a little kid, it wasn't about the money. I like the adventure. But what I'm telling you is consider the costs. I'm not a religious person, but I grew up, you know, in America, Judeo-Christian. I remember the preachers reading from Jesus Christ in the Bible. Said, consider the cost. Narrow is the way. And few there are that find it. Well, that's the same in every area of life, you know? So consider this cost because A, you're going to deal with alienation of people. Family members are going to either try to take your money or be bothered that you have it. Or even you pursue it. You're going to have the derogation of partners, that's a technical term. It's like I post, if I post a video with a pretty woman or a Lamborghini or whatever, if I just vlog my life, people often think that I created a life 
to show on social media. They don't know. I've been about that life before YouTube was even alive. I was already, I was owning nightclubs long, a decade before here in my garage. I was already living that life, but, and that's what's happened to you. You're going to show your real life and you're going to have derogation of partners, which means people want to talk, talk about you. You are a threat to their psyche. That's how, whether you start, however you see the psyche, if you're Freudian, you know, you got the ego, the super ego, the id. If you go back, if you're religious, you're going to perceive it as pride, humility. If you're in the modern world, Australians call it, you know, tall poppy syndrome. In Sweden, they call it jantelogen, jantelagen, janteloven. That means don't try to stand out. Yet on your path to making money, the inevitable happens and it shows up. Even if you ain't trying to, even if you don't want a Ferrari or a Lamborghini, people are going to figure out you're making money. And the second that happens, all of a sudden, the game theory of life begins to change because in the past, the family was your allies or supposed to, and your friends were supposed to be on your side. But all of a sudden, money is like a crowbar that cracks its way in and starts to pry the door from the doorframe, starts to pry you apart from those people. But the good news is there's a whole new set of allies for you. I just want to prepare you that the allies and friends and family that you think have your back now may not be there in a little bit. Because no, oh, nothing threatens the status hierarchy, especially of men, as you making more money than them. It's like Gandhi says, first, they don't know who you are. Then they laugh at you. Then they hate you. That's the first three stages. First, ain't nobody gonna know you're trying to make money. Second, they're gonna see, oh, look at him, he quit his job. Oh, he's gonna walk out his ego. What a risk taker, what a stupid choice. Trying to do this. And then third, they're gonna start to be bothered. I used to know them when they were down to earth. Blah, blah, blah. But the good news is there's a progression. Eventually you start to just watch you. Eventually they love you. And at last you become a legend. That's like Arnold Schwarzenegger. In his day, he wasn't always loved. Got his sixth Mr. Olympia. People said, oh, they gave it just because he's a movie star. He was hated by a community. Da, da, da. Now he's a legend. You know, you see that with ex-presidents. Nobody liked Half the world hated George W. Bush when he was president. Invasion of Iraq. Oh, da, da. Now he's like, oh, Democrats or Republicans love him because eventually you become a non-threat because you become a legend. But that legendary status is a progression that you may not have the chops to take, you know? And there's no reason to always take it. You can make good money. You can live an amazing life. I love, I lived with the Amish for two and a half years. None of them trying to get rich. Yet I admire them more than forceless people. So don't, this isn't an admiration thing. It's not a virtue thing. It's not a path that you, when I say this video is like, should you even pursue wealth? I'm serious. I'm going, if you, if you're not about the game, if you don't care about basketball, don't go to basketball games. You'll be fine. It's the same with money. If you don't really care about building business entrepreneurship, you know. And then lastly, this third point I said, you get paid in proportion to the difficulty of problems you solve. So I talked about personality traits, conscientiousness, the four parts of conscientiousness. I talked about considering the costs and the stages and the hate and derogation you'll inevitably, and the alienation. It's more than, it's less than a hate, it's alienation. But then the last one, okay, you have to love solving problems. And let's face it, most people don't. If you're a highly anxious person and every problem that's thrown at you, it's like your car alarm and any gust of wind that comes by the car gives you a heart attack. You may not want to try to make a lot of money. You want to manage a lot of people, a lot of crisis. You want to build. I mean, that might not be for you. Now, that's not to say that anxious people can't make money. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying consider that you will, as Elon Musk said, get paid in proportion to the difficulty of problems you solve. So if the only problem you want to solve is handing somebody a coffee, be a barista. There ain't no hate in it. I don't go into Starbucks and go, I'm superior to the barista. We're just all homo sapiens <laughs> just spinning through this, this solar system, you know, in many ways, undifferentiated from any organism on earth. You know, I have a thousand acres of organic farms. I got animals on there. When I see my horses, I'm not like, oh, I'm so superior. I'm just like, my DNA gave me a medium prefrontal cortex, MPFC. Makes me able to see things that a horse can't see and anticipate. But it also gives me more money, more problems, more brain power, more problems too. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You need to watch this video maybe twice because I'm gonna, I wanna be known as the guy who also set some people straight and said, this ain't for you. You know, it's like I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That ain't for everybody. You know, my mom doesn't care about that. I don't go to my mom every day and try to convince her to do jujitsu, do Muay Thai. Hey, you want to kick your shin against a pineapple tree, you know, banana tree? My mom's like, nope, I don't care. 
So some of you should just go, you know what? I watched this video, Ty sitting before we went to bed, sitting here with these blue blocker glasses on. This is from a company that I invest in, Swannies. They're cool. A little pitch, see? Put a little sales pitch in there just to bother people and be like, Ty doesn't give free value all the time. He all tries to throw in ads. Yeah, just like YouTube's gonna do. <laughs> people too stupid to even understand how the jungle works. Don't ever, by the way, when you ever go in the jungle, you don't have to apologize for being in that jungle and playing by the jungle rules. Sometimes people are like, why don't you give all your stuff away for free? I'm like, well, because I have expenses and the laws of the jungle says, as Warren Buffett says, the two rules of getting rich, don't lose money. And the second rule is, don't forget the first rule. So I ain't gonna go out and have costs and then give it all away for free. Why would I? The only people that do that are people inheriting money. My dad was in prison when I was born. I was born to a single mom, Long Beach. My dad was in Terminal Island, an island off of Los Angeles. So I'm like, don't let people lecture you that don't know about the law of the jungle. And also the law of the jungle, what they don't realize is there is nothing free. Energy. Energy comes at a cost, all things, always, biologically and economically. But I digress. So if you don't love solving problems, just do something else. So many things you can do. There's people who do nonprofits, charity, work at AIDS orphan. I admire those as much as I admire Forbes as person. I just happen to be in the jungle of making money, but I don't think my, there's other jungles out there. There's forests that don't have so many thorns and wild animals, you know? You may not want to go in the jungle. I'm not sure the jungle's better than, you know, I live with the Amish for two and a half years. Sometimes I look back and I go, that was a better life. But there's an inevitability sometimes and there's a causal kind of fortune, that fate and fortune intertwined. And this is where I find myself. And I try to pivot into things like I buy farms and I don't spend all my time making money, you know? And I'm not always optimizing for money. But that's for another conversation. This conversation was, are you sure you want to try to make money? Real money. Because it ain't for everybody and it shouldn't be for everybody. Any more than being an MMA UFC fighter should be for everybody. Eh, for everybody. Some people ain't built for it. Some people don't like to get punched in the face. People are like, oh, Ty, will you do influencer boxing? I'm like, mm, depends against who. For five million bucks, somebody in my weight class? Yeah, but I ain't getting knocked around by somebody in 250 pound weight class. It's just like making money. You know, I was just up in New York. I own pretty big companies. Pier One Imports, Radio Shack. I buy up these big American brands, global brands now. I'm up in New York, that's the jungle up there. And I'm thinking, I'm glad I'm only here for a week. You know, I don't, the good news is you don't have, to, you can put limits. Some people I know just want to be the richest person ever. They set these aspirations. I'm like, you sure you want to go that deep in the jungle? I bet you you don't. Even Elon Musk. In 2013, I went to a fireside, I went to a fireside chat. I, I kind of knew who Elon was, but not much. And my friend goes, you want to go hear this fireside chat in Santa Monica? It was either 2012 or 2013. I sit down there. Somebody asks, there's 30, 40 people in a room. Somebody asks Elon, you know, what's your advice or something? Would you do this again? And he's like, I wouldn't do this again for nothing. He said, I'd rather have shards of glass put in my eye than be an entrepreneur knowing what I know. And my second mentor has really been my smartest mentor. He died recently, Alan Nation. Alan Nation told me, he said, Ty, 99% of entrepreneurs, had they not been so naive at the beginning, would have never done it. <laughs> because that's why I said, if you would have known the day you walked into the money jungle, what that jungle was like, you'd probably be like, I'm gonna pitch a tent right outside here in the grass by the pond and fish for the rest of my life. And I wouldn't hate you at all. I'd be like, good job, you made a right choice. Don't admire the people that went where angels feared to tread. You know, they just plowed right into the jungle, money make a jungle, because you're gonna meet some scum in there. And you're gonna even, but you meet some great people too. That's why I said the jungle is a double-edged sword. What it giveth, it taketh away, and what it taketh away, it giveth. And therefore, it's not to be trifled with, but it's not something... And for the small percentage of you, the five, 10% that should go in this jungle, it's all right. Keep your head up in the jungle though. Keep your head up. Social media. Be careful who you listen to on social media because there's a lot of virtuous sounding people who tell you they have no ego and they're just doing it for this. Beware of the wolf in sheep's clothes. It's better to listen to the wolf in wolf's clothes. You know, in the jungle, you'd rather see a wolf, get the wolf on your side, not try to change the wolf's nature, the pit bull on your side. You don't want a nice pit bull, do you? When someone breaks into your house? No, you just want it nice to you. So when you come in the jungle, try to find those people who are as they appear, who are those people who unabashedly 
do what they do. Not those people who tell you, I'm not doing this to make money. I'm here in the jungle because I'm doing this for my grandkids. No, they're not. They're in there for themselves and that's okay. That is one thing Adam Smith was probably true in many ways. And I know some people hate capitalism and capitalism in imperfect form because humans at their nature are exploitative. Therefore, no economic system will ever be found as long as the human DNA has high levels of acquisitiveness, if you want to look up what that means, which means greed. And therefore, economic systems like capitalism are only somewhat of a check and balance on the innate nature of the people who in some ways always have to deal with the jungle. There's no one who won't go in the jungle. Even nonprofit people go out and raise money. But where Adam Smith was correct is that as people pursue, as you pursue, even your selfish ambitions, you oftentimes greatly benefit society. I saw interesting, a billionaire I liked, I reposted it, it said, Swedish billionaire, I forget his name. Instead of focusing on space, he bought 400,000 or 4 million acres of the Brazilian rainforest, just to preserve it. People with wealth may end up saving the world. Now you might say, well, if it was evenly distributed, then the exploitation wouldn't have happened that, you know, nah. There was exploitation before capitalism. Read the book Collapse by the Pulitzer Prize professor at UCLA, Jared Diamond. I interviewed him once and he, I have a company called Mentor Box, another shameless plug, where we get video summaries by the authors of books who so don't have to read the whole book. And you had Easter Island, they had environmental degradation to the point of extinction pre-capitalism, you know, and that happened many times. You had that in, you know, Africa. You had some of the exploitation of nature, creation of desertification, the creation of deserts. And you had that in Europe and you had that in Asia and you had it in South America and North America. It's endemic. It's a human trait. So the jungle is not just capitalism. The jungle existed before capitalism. It's re resource acquisition because organisms that can have extra for the winter that is coming do better than that, those that don't. And that's why humans always will hoard resources at some or try. And the most virtuous person who tells you about how their spirituality and their yoga and then Bali and this, that's the person going to take your money. So as I said, little practical tip, when you enter into the jungle, you want the pit bulls who tell you they're pit bulls up front and don't try to f tell you and post all this on Instagram. That's just them doing mine. They're in the game for making money. They're a wolf and that's okay. A wolf that shows themselves as a wolf will not be the end of your life. So I'm gonna go to bed. I got big company meeting. I try to fly in all my executives at least once a month. I live in Puerto Rico now, but I'm here in Miami. It's a little easier for me to get here. I have leaders of Radio Shack and Pier One, Dress Barn, Steinmark, all these big brands, Ralph and Russo come in. So I gotta get to bed, but I was like, let me pop a tripod on here on a pillow before I go to bed talk about the game nobody talks about this it's funny man people are like you don't need this there's all the info out there there ain't all the info out there not about the jungle the jungle's been written about the leash you might say no ty business books and i'm talking about people who live it not just professors i love professors there's not enough content talking on what i talked about today if there was i wouldn't have shot this video but so i've had to piece it together and curate it from i have 36 mentors that i talk to a lot some of them have Nobel Prizes. They're Eric Maskin at Harvard, Professor Pizzarides at London School of Economics. And some are just people that are just entrepreneurs, like my mentor, Joel Salatin. I still talk to him. Started talking to him when I was a teenager. Still seek his advice now. You ain't ever going to outgrow the need to have other wise people with you as you hunt in that jungle because you need people watching your back and you'll never see 360 in the jungle. It's too dark, too much convoluted. There's thorns and bushes you know, distractions. So surround yourself with the right people. Great motto I came up with when I was starting out in business. Good things happen when you're around the right people. So if this is helpful, I'll start dropping a little bit more like this. Drop me a follow, subscribe, try to put some stuff like this. If you listen, if you listen, you might be surprised how much this will help you. So if you disagree, put a comment. And what should I record next time? Leave me a little comment. Try to get to these. I don't have much time anymore to do social media, but once a week I could probably do this. So.